Well, that was a beautiful piece of music, wasn't it? And obviously, it stood out right away as a Japanese-type tune, a Japanese song. And that is because it was. And you might be saying, well, hold on a second now. Hold on. We're really smart in this classroom. And by the way, let's officially start the classroom. So we're looking at what obviously is a Foff hobby. We saw Herr Obermeister. So why in heaven's name do you have Japanese music playing, Scott? What's going on? Well, the simple answer is, this is a Japanese sewing machine that happened to be made well after World War II ended in 1945, obviously. And I would challenge any of you, if you want to try to look it up and date this machine, uh, good luck. It's a little bit challenging with some of these post-World War II machines, even, even ones that came decades after the war ended. And this particular one is a Foff Hobby Model 560Z, as in Zebra. 560Z. And it comes with a 0.8 amp motor, and that's going to be evident when you see me do these different sew-offs. It sews with so much ease, and the Japanese do a brilliant job of setting up that motor and drive system to meter out that power. It meters out the power just beautifully when it comes to laying down stitches through heavy duty uh, type materials just like this what's what's underneath the presser foot right now uh, genuine elk hide and I'm gonna lay down a straight stitch first and if I have enough room next to it I kinda cut this narrow and that was part of the leg time at the beginning of this premiere as you kept looking at the machine looking at the machine and you were expecting something to happen or for me to say something and nothing happened it's because I realized that I didn't have that genuine elk hide cut and I needed to cut it real quick so I was doing that off camera. You know we're all about being real here and that's that's the truth. So, <laughs> Alright, and you saw as well in the opening shot the sew offs that have already been done. I'm going to lay, lay those on the end of the bed. But first of all, well you know what, let me, let me do this genuine elk hide and then I'll tell you the story behind this machine a little bit if you haven't followed it on Facebook. So here goes a straight stitch uh, through a single layer of genuine elk hide, which is about four or five ounces of leather. And if you kind of look at it from the side, you can see it's basically like basically like sewing a belt. We're sewing a belt. So uh, let me take the take up arm all the way up, and here we go with a single layer of uh, genuine elk hide. Whoops! There we go. I didn't have that take-up arm all the way up, and that's what can happen when you don't do that. You don't get good traction. So, but this this machine has, when I did the test sew-offs in that, it has a lot of get up and go, a lot of power. And we're going to lay down a zigzag right next to it. Because I think I've got enough room in there to squeak a zigzag out. We'll see. Alright, so I'm going to change my settings, and actually I'll show you how to do this. This is a good learning lesson as well. So yeah, rule number one, if you're sewing leather like this, see that from the side? Make sure your take-up arm is all the way at the highest position. Otherwise, you're not going to get good traction, just like I didn't get it right there. So first of all, just a quick little walk around the machine, and then we'll change the setting to, to do a zigzag. Uh, right over here, we've got two things. We've got stitch length control, and we've got reverse right in the middle there. You just push that big old button. The Japanese love their big old buttons. So you just push that button in, uh, hold it in, you'll be sewing the reverse, and then release it, and you'll resume sewing forward again. And then we've got settings here from 0 all the way to 5, as far as... Uh, stitch length and when we're doing uh, five of the stitches that we're going to do today we've got to have it set on five for sure in the yellow region uh, otherwise uh, we're not going to get a good outcome and then over on zero and you can see it's colored in blue if you do buttonholes which we're not going to do in this premiere today 
you'll want to set it on the zero to do the buttonholes and you'll see that on the different stitch selection options. So let me go actually up to those stitch selection options. So here's our stitch selector right here, this knob. And then we can choose any of these stitches. Again, you can see the ones that are colored with yellow on the bottom. We've got to set that stitch length selector all the way to five. And then we can sew those stitches. And then we've got like a three-point stitch in red just to the left of it. We've got a standard, uh, uh, looks like a blind hem type stitch. A zigzag stitch in green. And then finally a straight stitch is what, what we're set on right now. And then way over here you can see those uh, buttonhole uh, options that I'm not going to be deal dealing with those today. Because we've got a lot of other stuff to cover. So if I'm going to do a zigzag, I can, I can do a couple of things. I have to do a couple of things, I should say. Up here we've got a quick selector. So the first thing I need to do is I need to move that from straight stitch over to zigzag. And always make sure your needle is obviously clear of the material when you do this. And you've got two zigzag options. You've got a super wide one or a more narrow one. Because we're dealing with a fairly tight space, why don't I move it to the one that's not quite as wide as the widest one to the right of it. We'll, we'll probably use that as well in the premiere, but we're not going to do it right now. And then if I drop down, it's really, really easy with this stitch selector to change it from straight stitch, just turn it to the right clockwise, one turn, and we're over to zigzag now. And that's it. Unless we want to make some changes on the, uh, the stitch length, which we're not going to do, then we're done. So I'm going to go down to the uh, leather, down to our genuine elk hide. And this time, hopefully, I'll do a better job of getting my take-up arm at the highest position so we don't, we're not like spinning our wheels. And let's see how Carolyn's machine does with this task. All right, take-up arm is all the way at the highest position. Duh. How many times have I said that to all of you? <clears throat> so, all right, here we go with a zigzag. Uh, through this very thick, genuine elk hide. Here we go. Well, that was super easy. <laughs> that point amps, point eight amps just kicks in. It really does. Point eight amps is a is a meaty enough motor. And I can see I've got just a little bit of residue on here from uh, oiling the machine. Just a little bit of residue. So let's finally take a look at these stitches that we just laid down on this uh, genuine elk hide. Hopefully I have that ang angled correctly towards the camera. And you're going to be able to see these uh, clearly enough. If I keep, keep the camera still you can. So the bottom stitch is the first one we laid down, a straight stitch, and that's spot on. We're going to look at these at the same time because they're so close together. So we've got the straight stitch and we've got the zigzag on top, and both of those stitches are just absolutely spot on. The stitch formation, the stitch uh, presentation, the stitch layout of that is exactly as we want to see it. Just a beautiful job on the part of uh, Carolyn's machine. And I haven't, even, I haven't even gone into the story yet telling you the story behind this machine, which I probably should do. So during one of the premieres, <clears throat> and I'll tell you this as we're turning this around to look at the uh, lock stitch. <clears throat> during one of the premieres, let me just pull that real quick. <clears throat> during one of the premieres, uh, I, I got into a conversation with uh, Carolyn out of California, and she shared that many, many years ago, she had taken her uh, 1970 singer uh, into a service center in California and uh, had brought it in to get it serviced. And uh, 
Time kept passing. Beautiful stitching, by the way. Although I would probably increase that upper tension just slightly because I can see that we're not getting enough pull on that zigzag. And that happens sometimes when you get needle swing into the action. But uh, the straight stitches, uh, the balance on that uh, tension is just spot on. So I'm going to give that a definite pass because it's a simple uh, tension issue that I need to deal with. And I should also mention, as I'm sharing Carolyn's story, uh, that I'm uh, at the prompting of a, of a new friend out of New Jersey who said, we know that you love Schmetz needles. You should try a Schmetz leather needle. And so that's what I'm sewing with today. Uh, remember the other person on, out of New York had suggested trying a leather needle. And so I tried uh, a different type of leather needle. I think it might have been a, a, a Singer leather needle. Uh, so now I've got a Schmetz leather needle. And all in all, I'm pretty happy with it. But it'll be interesting when we get into some of the more intricate uh, uh, decorative stitching as to how this uh, machine does with a leather needle. But it did a beautiful job on this uh, genuine uh, elk hide. I'm going to throw the rest of these stitch-offs to the back as well. So Carolyn mentioned during the premiere that she'd taken her machine in. <coughs> a lot of time, <coughs> a lot of time had passed, and she was getting a little bit nervous about uh, why was it taking so long. Probably like many of you do with your machines here, but you don't get nervous; you just wonder. So um, she kept trying to contact these folks, and then all of a sudden, with little or no warning this uh, shop in California went out of business and uh, they still had an active phone line so she left several messages and they just ignored her and so eventually she just gave up and then a lot of time passed and then apparently she discovered uh, discovered me and so during this premiere she shared her, sto her story a little bit about uh, her machine basically being stolen by this, uh, this service center, because they never returned it, and they could have. I mean, going out of business doesn't mean you can't return a customer's sewing machine. God forbid it ever happened to me, but I certainly would get everybody's sewing machine back to them if it ever happened to me, but it won't, because of all of you, and because of all of your commitment and your loyalty. But uh, she basically shared that, and I, I said, and she didn't go into all the particulars. She just shared some of the basic stuff. And so I said, well, you know what? If someone had extenuating circumstances, I certainly would look at giving them a free sewing machine. And then she reached out a couple days later and shared in greater detail her circumstances. And I said, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to go through my personal collection, see if I have a machine that would be similar to the one that you had that was from the 1970s, a Singer model. And uh, this is the machine that I came up with, this uh, Foff Hobby uh, from uh, Japan. It was made uh, post-World War II. <coughs> and this is a, <coughs> excuse me, this is a model, and I think I already mentioned this, but it's a model uh, 560Z, if any of you want to try to help me date the machine again. So I've been working on preparing this uh, Foff Hobby out of Japan for Carolyn for a couple weeks now and we finally have reached this milestone now being able to sew off on it which is really exciting and what we're going to do now is some uh, heavy grade denim I believe that uh, Carolyn mentioned a couple of times in her post as I announced that this machine was going to be given to her she mentioned that she really is excited to get back to trying to sew denim again and hopefully she doesn't try sewing denim with a Schmetz leather needle like I am. But you can imagine if she uses a more appropriate needle for denim, she's going to get even a better outcome than I do today. Uh, so it'll, it'll be kind of interesting to see how this, uh, this Schmetz leather needle does with several layers of denim. So I've got two layers to start. I'm going to fold it in half and get us up to four layers. And if you look at it from the side... That is not a simple task at all. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and slide it underneath the presser foot. And we're going to go down and around with four layers of heavy grade denim. And I'm going to do this with a straight stitch. So I'm going to switch my settings from zigzag uh, back to straight stitch again. 
Let's see here. Okay, I think I've got that set correctly, that set correctly. I'm still kind of getting familiar with this machine. It came out of my personal collection, but realize my personal collection has been building for decades. So some of these machines I haven't touched or looked at for a very long time. So I'm, I'm kind of reacquainting myself because I didn't have a lot of prep time getting ready for this premiere. It's been so busy, and plus I'm getting ready to take a trip uh, to Minnesota to pick up a machine that uh, needs saving. And uh, so uh, if, I'm, if I have a couple little hiccups during this premiere, you'll just have to be, you'll just have to be forgiving. So here we go with four layers of heavy grade denim. I'm going to make sure my take up arm is all the way at the highest position. And uh, let's jump into this. Here we go. I slowed it down there because I kind of jumped into that fast and furious and I've got to make a turn. What the heck? Alright, here we go. I'm going to slow it down a little bit. That's the beauty again of the way the Japanese engineer their power systems, or as they say over in Europe, their engines, their engines are engineered quite well, and uh, you can really take it slow, almost like having a slow gear without having a slow gear, and you still can get real consistent uh, power delivery with this machine. So, all right, here we go to the finish, and I don't think I'm going to close the box. All right, so four layers of heavy grade denim. Let's see how we did using a Schmetz leather needle that my friend out of New Jersey had recommended I try. We're getting a lot of East Coast involvement, and I like it. My friend out of New York said, try a leather needle. I tried a Singer. Now we're trying a Schmetz leather needle. I like when folks get involved. I really do. They step out of the shadows, and they get involved with what I'm doing. And they make great recommendations. And I'll tell you, if we're using a leather needle on four layers of heavy grade denim, we got a real good outcome. I like the look of this. I like the look of this. And the tension setting seems to be just perfect for the type of thread, needle, and the material that I just sewed off on. So let's take a look at these stitches. This is our top stitch first. And we'll see how uh, Carolyn's machine did with this task. And those are some beautiful stitching. Some beautiful stitching. Spacing the formation, uh, the integrity of the stitch. You can particularly see it as we come down that side over there. Absolutely spot on. Excellent, excellent stitching. We'll come out and look at the uh, totality of the stitches. Let me turn it around and we'll look at that lock stitch. And I always have been a, a fan of Schmetz needles. I've just never really used any leather needles by Schmetz. But I'm kind of glad my friend out of New Jersey suggested that because I'm liking this even on denim. How cool is that? So let's go around and look at this lock stitch on here. Beautiful stitching as well by this Foff Hobby that is going to soon be heading out to California to replace that machine that was stolen by that nasty repair service that went out of business and didn't uh, return customers' calls. I'm guessing other customers probably lost their machines as well. So that is just a gorgeous stitch. And as we look at the totality of it as well on the lock stitch, it's a definite pass for four layers of uh, heavy grade denim. And I think what I'll do real quick, since I have this material and I have all this open space in the middle, is I'll lay down a couple of other stitches as well on this denim to see how this Schmetz leather needle does. I think we'll lay down a zigzag, and I think we'll also lay down uh, a blind hem stitch. If I can remember how to set it on this machine. <laughs> so, so now we're gonna try to do a zigzag where do I have this one set? Yep, I have this one set. I've got to move that one. Our quick selector, I've got to move it from straight stitch uh, over to zigzag. And we'll go with a, the widest zigzag this time. 
and then I've got to move my main stitch selector that's our quick selector there I've got to remove our main selector and yes my needle is clear of the material one turn to the right to get us into the zigzag setting let me just make sure it clicked in so we should be set on zigzag now the widest zigzag and I'm going to take us back down to the needle and we'll see how this uh, Foff Hobby with a Schmetz leather needle does sewing this real super wide uh, zigzag pattern. All right, here we go. <clears throat> and again, I'm kind of taking it slow just to show you that you can. All right, so let's see. I'll pull this out, and then we'll take a look at it, the uh, the back side of the material once we lay down this blind hem stitch. Again, I haven't touched this machine for probably decades, close to that. So hopefully, I remember how to set the uh, blind hem stitch. I think I do. Pretty sure. Eighty percent sure. get this back into position. Okay, so we're going to do a couple of things real quick to try to get this blind hem stitch. We come back up here. I'll get a wide enough shot so we can do it all at the same time instead of going back and forth. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to move our quick selector. We basically have two zigzag pattern choices, super wide, less wide. We have a middle position and then we have uh, uh, a straight stitch and kind of a modified straight stitch. So I'm going to move it right to the middle, right there, and then I'm going to turn our stitch selector one click to the right, which should give us, keep your fingers and toes crossed, it should give us a blind hem stitch. Again, I didn't I didn't spend a lot of prep time because getting ready to go to Minnesota and just kinds of all kinds of other stuff going on. So hopefully I got it right. If I didn't, we'll just we'll try something else, right? <laughs> all right. So here goes what we hope is a blind hem stitch. You know what? The only other thing I'm going to change real quick, and I'm off camera on this, is I'm going to move our stitch uh, length from five down to three. From five to three. So that's easy enough to do. All right, here we go. Well, let's hope for a blind hem stitch. Here we go. After I take my take-up arm all the way up so I don't spin my wheels again. Hey. I still did it a little bit. But I got a blind hem stitch, so. All right, let's see how our Foff Hobby model 560Z with a leather Schmetz needle did sewing off on this four layers of heavy grade denim. Much better than my clippers are doing. All right. So now we'll look at all of these extra stitches that we just laid down. First of all, we'll look at the uh, top stitch. Kind of angle it like that. After I clip my other thread, which is like super long. And that one is super long. Alright, that angle should be pretty good, I think. And we can look at both of these at the same time. We've already gone around the field of straight stitching, which is absolutely spot on and fabulous. Now we're looking at the top row, which is our zigzag, the bottom row, which is our blind hem, and uh, both of those top stitches just look spectacular. They look spot on. The spacing, look at the thickness of that. The spacing, the formation, the integrity of the stitch. I almost did like a little rewind. Did you see that? Is exactly as it should be. Beautiful stitching. 
Beautiful stitching. So we'll zoom out a little bit, look at the totality of the field of straight stitching, the zigzag, and then also the blind hem. And now we'll spin this around and we'll take a look at the lock stitch. We'll see how the lock stitch turned out. Again, using a leather Schmitz needle with this uh, Foff Hobby Model 560Z, 560Z, made in again, again in the beautiful country of Japan. So here's our lock stitch. Looks absolutely spot on, as does our blind hem below. And again, we're talking four layers of heavy grade denim. And denim is a material that apparently Carolyn is really excited to be able to sew again. Well, especially if she uses a proper needle, that would be more appropriate for denim than a leather needle. She'll have a lot of fun doing that. <laughs> so, anyway, we zoom out again, look at the uh, totality of the lock stitch uh, outcome that we got for the straight stitch, the zigzag, the blind hem. Absolutely perfect, as is the top stitch. So I'm going to throw this to the back as well by... Herr Obermeister, who is still a little bit confused about, he was told that there was a foff on the workbench over here, so he right away rallied and came over to, you know, to check it out and to, and to be present. And then I kick on Japanese music, and now I'm talking more about Japan, and he's just like, I don't get it. I don't get it. Foff is German. Foff is German. Why are you talking about Japan? Why Japan? So, <laughs> all right, a little bit more. Uh, Japanese style music. All right, so we're going to do some more sewing now with some other materials that I have here, which includes our heavy grade canvas, the blue stuff. starting with four layers it looks like I could try going all the way up to eight should I try that let me just change this back to a straight stitch We're back at a straight stitch I'm gonna extend our straight stitch all the way to five which I kind of just did off camera so one two three four eight layers of this stuff gosh I don't know if I've ever tried eight layers before. Can I even fit it underneath the presser foot? Maybe I can. And this uh, this particular model, the 560Z, does not have any hyperextension, so it is what it is. That's what you got. And it does not have a quick release on the uh, presser foot pressure either. So. Alright, well I'm hoping I didn't bite off more than I could chew. We'll give it a try, and if it's too much, then I'll go ahead and uh, I'll go ahead and reduce it to four layers. Because again, I'm using a, a, a leather needle and it may just not be suitable for going through this many layers of heavy grade uh, canvas like this. So let's try it, but we'll be prepared to change gears in a sense if it doesn't have a good outcome. All right, here we go. A straight stitch through eight layers of this super heavy uh, blue canvas that I've shown in a couple of other premieres. Here we go. And this machine, almost as if it was insulted, showed you what it can do with eight layers of canvas using a leather needle. It was like, Go through your little dramatic speech, Scott, about can we do it, can we not do it, and I'm just going to get it done, which is what Carolyn's machine just did. And I'll be honest with you, I'm impressed, just because I know I've sewn this, uh, this uh, particular canvas before, but I don't believe that I've done eight layers of it. And uh, I'm, I'm just impressed. Look at that from the side. And I can't see what you're seeing because I don't have my screen turned. Hey, there it is. 
that's that, if that isn't considered the thick of thick I don't know what thick is folks seriously if we turn it over there's our top stitch see if I can move the camera in a little bit and again we did this with a leather needle folks a leather needle on canvas eight layers of canvas nonetheless and look at that top stitch the spacing the formation the integrity of the stitch the presentation of the stitch okay I'll say it the glory of the stitch is just absolutely spot on and that must be probably right at the launch there where there's a little bit of a misalignment of the stitches but everything else once I got that material feeding uh, evenly over the feed dogs is just exactly as it should be look at that from from a distance even okay I, I'll say it the totality of the stitching is just absolutely spot on And again this was with a leather needle folks a leather needle and I'm seeing a little bit of an anomaly on the back of here with the lock stitch which I'm not horribly concerned about because again we're using a needle that's designed for leather and we just went through eight layers of this canvas material so I would have to mess around with this the uh, the tension a little bit in order to get a consistent flow of stitches we started out good and that's not a miss stitch right there it's just a tension issue and we move back into a rhythm again beautifully right there so a little bit of an anomaly in the middle there but this again is our lock stitch through eight layers of heavy grade canvas again I would describe it as uh, commercial grade canvas just because of the density of it when I compare it to US Army grade canvas and it just laid down beautiful stitching a little bit of a hiccup there a little bit of a hiccup there but the rest of the stitching is just absolutely spot on using a leather needle through this much canvas is just it's crazy that we got this good of an outcome to be honest with you so uh, I'm extremely pleased and I'm gonna give that a definite pass recognizing the tasks that we took on the, the needle that we're using and just how well this FOF hobby did with it so I'm gonna throw that to the rear as well and since we have a leather needle in there why don't we sew some more leather I think that makes sense it might make sense <laughs> and eventually I'd like to show you some of these other decorative decorative stitches as well that are built into this uh, machine that Carolyn's going to be enjoying out in California. First of all, I'm going to find a little bit more music to put on. This is a fun piece, kind of a drum piece. So again, I'll just show you real quick the adjustment that we're going to make. Right now we're, actually, you know what? I'll leave it on straight stitch for right now. I think I will. Yeah, so let's go back down to the needle and we'll do a little bit more leather sewing. Okay, so so far we've done, I'm just gonna kind of review this with you so you have an idea. And some of this is off camera, some of this is on camera. But between off and on camera, this is what I've sewn on this needle so far. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. Between the canvas we just did, the denim, the canvas again was eight layers, four layers of heavy grade denim. The uh, this again was off camera. This 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 next one that I did with uh, genuine elk hide, and I did a combination of different stitches with it. And then I did this leather as well, which is an Italian leather with decorative stitching. And then I did these on camera. One of these on camera. This shorter one, I think, with the elk hide again, doing a zigzag and a straight stitch. Uh, I mean, I have just been I have been working this needle to the hilt and we're gonna work it some more because it's a Schmetz needle for goodness sakes it should almost be magical 
Right, Herr Obermeister? It came out of Germany. It came out of Deutschland. Okay, so I think what we'll lay down on this leather, just so we can try it, is like a three-point stitch. And I'll show you what that looks like on the stitch selector on Carolyn's uh, Foff Hobby. So it's going to be that red one right there next to uh, the, what is it? We have the straight, the zigzag, the blind hem, and then we've got the three points. So right next to the blind hem stitch, where you can see the little breaks in it, you know, this is our regular zigzag, the green one. And then we've got the breaks in it here, which is showing us like a three point stitch. We're going to try doing that next on leather. And it's real simple. All we do is just move our, well, we have to do a couple things, actually. We have to move our quick selector off of uh, straight stitch and move it to the middle point right there. And then we're going to move our main sti stitch selector uh, three clicks to the right. We're going from straight stitch to zigzag to blind hem to three point stitch. And now we're going to try laying down that three point stitch. Actually, you didn't see any of that because I was just off camera. So, let's act like we just reversed it. And yes, my material is clear of the needle, or the needle is clear of the material, however you want to say it. So we started over here on our straight stitch. Now we're going to zigzag, blind hem, and then a three-point stitch. And we've already changed our quick selector on top from straight to that middle point. And... Uh, we should be good. I've got my stitch length on five. I'm gonna probably gonna back that off a little bit. Let's back it off from five down to three, just to give that uh, stitch pattern a little bit more definition. And let's go down to our our leather. And again, well, this is not quite as thick as the genuine elk hide. Look at the thickness of this uh, leather as well, as my camera continues to move. And I'm not touching it. I'm not touching it, folks. <laughs> so, all right, let's see how Carol, Carolyn's uh, Foff Hobby Model 560Z does with this uh, three-point stitch on this uh, genuine uh, Italian leather. And this Italian leather has a real strong nap to it, so we're going to have a little bit of trouble seeing that lock stitch, but it is what it is. So... Let me make sure my take-up arm is in the right position. I've messed up on that a couple of times. And then we can get some good positive traction launching off. This machine is powered by a belt with uh, some pulley tensioners. And so if you don't have that take-up arm at the highest position, uh, you can get a little bit of, uh, of a spin-out when you're first starting, as you've witnessed during this premiere. And that's just a, that's operator error. That's not uh, the machine's fault. All right, so here we go with a three-point stitch going through a single layer of uh, Italian leather. Let's see how we do. Here we go. It's probably one of the longest runs I've done during this premiere, and it's just fun. It's just fun to listen to that machine, isn't it? And it's also going to be fun to look at this three-point stitch as well, which... Again, we're sewing leather with a leather needle. Hey, that makes sense. <laughs> oh, you know what? We got to test the limits. It's kind of like when I don't use a leather needle and I sew leather, and now I'm using a leather needle to sew everything from canvas to you name it. So yeah, we don't we don't follow the rules sometimes in the classroom. And since I'm one of the teachers, I can kind of get away with that, which is kind of fun. That is just a beautiful stitch. Oh my gosh. I'm going to lay down one other stitch next to it because I just hate to waste that leather. And I have no idea what this next stitch is called, but I'm going to zoom in on it. Maybe one of you can type it in the chat if you know what the technical term is for it. Otherwise, it, I'm going to call it the sideways comb stitch. All right? I'll just give you a quick little preview before we move over to that. There's our three-point stitch. Isn't that beautiful? I love that stitch. Gorgeous. 
so we just did the three point which is, is that zigzag that looks like it's broken up the kind of off red one where the dot is that makes it easier doesn't it now we're going to do one click to the right to this sideways comb stitch and like I said I'm sure it has another name about 98 percent sure oh and you know what I've got to do first this is a great lesson I was gonna to go to that comb stitch right but look at where that comb stitch is it's in the yellow field let me come out a little bit here that comb stitch is in the yellow field and I was getting ready to turn to it and the machine has a safeguard that if you don't have your stitch length set all the way to five where it's marked in yellow you can't turn that stitch dial and you don't want to try to force it either so for that comb stitch and all the other stitches to the right of it we've got to be set on five so I'm going to turn that back to five and now we should be able to move that stitch selector on top to the desired stitch that we want that's in that yellow field and we can it's magic and engineering too so we're on this this weird little comb stitch thing whatever it is we're, we've got our stitch length on five we have to uh, again you don't want to force if you have one of these machines and you can't turn it it's because your stitch length is not set on five in that yellow field and it will actually I mean if you try to turn a knob it's like it's locked and you don't want to force it because eventually you'll be able to turn it but you'll probably break something so let's try this weird comb style stitch again if you know another name for it by all means put it in the chat and we may refer to it that way we may not because we're rebels it's what we are <laughs> so, all right let's try this comb stitch single layer of Italian leather let's see, let's see how it does and thankfully we're using a leather needle all right take up arm all the way up so we get some good positive traction all right here we go double checking I have everything set correctly <laughs> All right, I'm going to slow it way down. And I'm going to speed it up. And I actually ended in the up position. Oh my gosh, that like never happens. Yeah, this is a pretty cool looking stitch kind of a comb style stitch that's what I'm gonna call it anyway alright let's clip our threads and we'll look at all of these and I'm probably gonna to have to hold it because it's a single layer it's not gonna have the stability to kinda of stand on its own even if I put it up with the clips it's probably gonna fall over so we will see what we see will it work? it might work going to work real well but all right let's give it a try I'm going to put Herr Obermeister behind this other side to hold this other side up thank you Herr Obermeister thank you he wanted to get into the shot anyway he's been itching to get on the camera he is a major photo boom type guy right Herr Obermeister <laughs> so, all right so let's take a look at these and I actually have it upside down don't I because that top stitch is the comb stitch that we did second but just reverse it in your mind you know what I mean so the bottom row we did first we'll go down both of them look at them at the same time is the three point stitch top row is the comb stitch and the stitch spacing the formation is just absolutely spot on see what happens when you use a leather needle on leather I mean I can get the same thing from a regular Schmetz needle too but it's kinda of fun
beautiful stitching. We'll come out a little bit on that shot. I'll flip it around so we can look at the uh, lock stitch. But those are gorgeous stitches. Gorgeous stitches. The three point and the uh, comb stitch. And I'll flip it the other way this time so we're actually looking at, looking at them in order. We're looking at them in the order that we sewed them. That's going to be a little bit of a challenge. Again, this uh, Italian leather is real nappy when it comes to uh, being able to see that lock stitch. So we'll get as close as we can and try to try to take a look at it, but it may be a little bit of a challenge. So the bottom row again is going to be our three point. Top row is going to be our comb stitch. Yeah, it's real tough to see it. Real tough to see it. Once in a while you can see it kind of peek through. There it is, right there, peeking through. But I can tell you, sitting at the workbench, being a lot closer, um, it's absolutely spot on. And I always like to try to give you folks the best visibility I possibly can. Not of Herr Obermeister's boots, although those are cool too. But let me see if, I, if I'm able to in any way pull this back a little bit more for you. Because I really do want you to be able to see these lock stitches. And it's really tough, really, really tough through this type of leather with that nap. <clears throat> so, let's see what we can do. As I'm looking over my shoulder here, start all the way in the end. Start with that uh, top row. This is super tough. Even pulling it back, it's super tough. That nap is just so, so dense. Let's see if we can see any of that uh, other comb stitch on the bottom. Yeah, we can, actually. Although it looks like I have it upside down. So a definite pass uh, for this sew off with the single layer of uh, Italian leather with the uh, comb style stitch and then also the three point stitch. So I'm going to throw that to the rear. Thank you Herr Obermeister for helping hold that. I could not have done that on my own. There's no way. And now what we're going to do is we're going to access, since we're already set for it, we're going to access the remaining one, two, three, four stitches that also need to be uh, in that yellow region on stitch length. I'm just trying to figure out how to line this leather that I have cut in such a weird way. We'll, we'll align it like this, I think. Yeah, that'll work, I think. All right, presser foot is down. And we're going to sew the next one, which I'm going to call a hop sketch type stitch. A hop stitch stitch. Yes, I'm, I'm making that up totally. And you can see it's the white one just to the right of where the uh, orange dot is to signify where we're set right now on the comb stitch. I'm going to turn that one turn to the right to get us to the, uh, whatever I called it, the hop sketch stitch. Because it kind of looks like a hop sketch, doesn't it? All right, it probably doesn't, but that's what I'm going to call it. So we're going to try the hop sketch stitch. And then without going back and forth, we're then going to go to the next stitch, the red one. I'll just click on it. And then the green one to the right of that. And then finally the white one way over there on the right side. You can barely see it in the camera, I think. So let's first of all go back to that one, the hop stitch. The hop stitch stitch. <clears throat> and we'll go down to the needle and check that out. And again, I'll try to vary the uh, presser foot speed just so you can see that you've got a lot of flexibility with the power output on this uh, machine that's uh, heading out towards Carolyn. Let's see here. And a lot of these are written in uh, Oriental writing, so I can't really tell you what the titles are. Sorry. <laughs> 
All right, let's try this hop stitch stitch here. And again, if you know what it's actually called, by all means, type it in the chat. I like my name better. Whatever it's called, I like my name better. All right, here we go. Let me grab a drink of water. My throat is real dry. Where's my water? There it is. Oh. <clears throat> All right, here goes our hop skit stitch. So there I'm kind of metering out the power. stitch I like that I like that stitch that's really cool okay so now we're gonna go to the next stitch again I'm just gonna keep on going down and then we'll look at all of them at the same time stitch next to this. We have plenty of leather. I don't have to crunch it too much. Plenty of room. Okay, so I'm going to click at one to the right. We'll get our next stitch output. And let's see what this one looks like. Get my take up arm to the right position. Here we go. And that's probably only about 30% of the way down on the foot pedal. Seriously. This machine has a lot, a lot of reserve power. A lot of reserve power. Okay, so that is our next stitch. Now we're going to clip these threads if I can get my hands working. <clears throat> there we go. Yeah, I'm liking those. Those are really cool. Those are really cool. You should be able to see them in the camera, even at this point. Okay, so I'm going to give it another click over, and I'm going to call this my uh, Tiki Lamp Stitch. Yeah, that's a good name for it. My Tiki Lamp Stitch. It just has a tiki look to it. Don't you think? If I bring the camera up real quick. The green one I'm talking about. Does it almost look like bamboo? Like layers of bamboo? Yeah. Yeah. So now we have a new name for this. It's called the Tiki Lamp Stitch. If you know what it's really called, keep it to yourself. We really don't care. <laughs> and Carolyn, since it's her machine, she can call it whatever she wants to call it. She might come up with another name. You never know. <laughs> Alright, so let's try this tiki lamp stitch. This is our next one. <clears throat> Here we go. Alright, brakes on! Yeah, that is a cool stitch. I like that. I like that one a lot, too. That looks like it'd be a really, really good stitch to use if you're trying to put uh, some sort of a mend onto something or something like that. 
Looks like it'd be a good mending stitch, a good binding stitch. Yeah, that's a cool stitch too. So we just have one left, one stitch left to do, and a lot of, a lot of leather remaining. This is obviously a bigger piece than I needed. So let's try this last one, and I'm going to call it the bamboo roll. The bamboo roll. So we have the tiki lamp stitch, now we have the bamboo roll, and I'll show you the bamboo roll, and then you can decide what you might want to call it. There it is, the last one. Looks like bamboo in a row, doesn't it? Bamboo roll stitch. Yeah, I like it. And my box closers right now are saying, that's not what it's called! You can't call it a bamboo roll! Yeah, I just did. Alright, here we go with the bamboo roll stitch. So excited there, I almost went off. I, I, my, my, my bamboo was rolling too much. My bamboo was definitely rolling too much. And what this really looks like is it looks like a, uh, a straight stitch with an overlay feature in the stitch pattern where it just it keeps going over and over and over and over it kind of going back and forth, back and forth. You can see the action of the uh, feed dogs were just really, really working to try to get that uh, laid down in a certain way. So since we're already in this area and I've laid all these other ones down and we got so much leather left, let's go back to our three-point stitch again. And that's not going to be in the yellow region. That's going to be, uh, we can set that however we want to set it. So I am going to back it off to three again because I can get away with that. And I'm going to bring our take-up arm all the way up because I do want to look at all of these semi-decorative stitches together in kind of in a row and then Carolyn can look at them as well because obviously I always send my confirmation sew-offs with the machine when it goes. So here goes our triple point zigzag modified wangy dangy stitch. Another name I know. And we'll see how this one looks on this type of leather. Again we're dealing with Italian leather and uh, Italian leather, again, and I've mentioned this in other premieres, tends to be a real slippery leather. So, uh, but the, the Japanese do a fabulous job with feed dog design and flow, so uh, the, the machine is just not having any trouble at all with it. So here goes our triple point zigzag wangy dangy stitch. Try writing that down. Here we go. Whoops. All the way on the foot pedal there, buddy. All the way in the foot pedal. Or as my formal friends say, the foot controller. Which almost sounds like the device is controlling your foot, doesn't it, when you say foot controller? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> Alright, let's get that thread back there. We'll clip off the rest of these threads. seeing if I want to lay anything else down next to it. I've got so much room left, you know what I mean? I've got so much room. Let's lay down a blind hem next to it too. Then we can kind of look at all those stitches together. So I'm just clicking it one click to the left back to the blind hem and let's lay down a blind hem now next to our triple point wangy dangy stitch. Here we go. more room. We still have more room. What the heck? All right. What else can we lay down next to it? We're kind of running out of stitch options here. I guess we could lay down a basic zigzag. Or I could just cut the material and just pretend that it was that size. I think I'll go with option two. 
let's just cut the material and pretend that it was that size. Hold on a second. Plus I can put on more beautiful Japanese music at the same time while I'm up and about. Alright, so close your eyes for a second so you can imagine that this material was never, never cut, although you know it was, so... It's actually not bad right there, is it? <clears throat> Let me do it like this. We'll try something different. Although I can elevate it a little bit with the clips in the back, maybe. Yeah, I like that. That'll work. All right, so let's look at our field of stitches, which is a field of dreams, too. So, I'm, and I'm not going to name them again, okay? I'm not going to name them. You name them as I'm going over them. So there's our top row right there. Absolutely gorgeous stitching. Beautiful stitching all the way around even from this angle. Although I'll be honest with you, I kind of like the angle when it's up better. You can see it dimensionally a little bit better. Especially that blind hem is a lot clearer when you have it setting up like this, isn't it? So there's our field of stitches and we pretty much covered the spectrum of uh, the stitches that uh, Carolyn's machine will do. And uh, this Foff Hobby Model 560Z as in Zulu did a fabulous job. We turn it around. Again, we're looking at the, the nap of Italian leather, which isn't quite as bad as some of the other leather types. And uh, again, we can even from this distance look at the totality of it and uh, see that this, uh, this machine of Carolyn's did a fabulous job. I'll zoom in a little bit. We kind of look at them closer up. A little bit hard to see through the nap, but not, not horrible. There's our little blind hem stitch on the bottom. Kind of come out again and look at it all together. So I think this is a definite pass as well. I think Carolyn's machine did a fabulous job. You can really see the uh, the beauty of those stitches when we turn around and look at that top stitch just because of the way the leather presents it. So I'm going to throw that to the back as well as a pass. And uh, again, I'm going to kind of show you the stack. I'll put the stack on the bed of the sew offs that we've already done on camera and off camera with uh, the needle that's in this machine right now. And again, it's, it's why I love Schmetz. But I typically do not use a Schmetz leather needle, which is what I'm using right now. Look at that. Isn't that crazy? All those sew-offs were done on this Schmetz leather needle that's in the uh, machine as we speak. If that isn't confirmation of how this machine is able to sew, then I guess I don't have a clue. But I think it definitely speaks volumes about my level of confidence in what Carolyn's machine can do when you look at the scope of the sewing, <clears throat> the various thicknesses, and the fact that we're using a leather needle to sew a, a diverse field of different sew-offs and having some really, really outstanding outcomes. So I'm extremely pleased, extremely pleased. I'm going to move those to the back and just see if there's anything else in my little stack of things that I prepared that I want to consider trying. I think I'm going to do just one more sew-off. 
I've got a couple options here that I could use. I think I'm going to do my compressed felt. And I'll do three layers of it as I, as I typically do. So I'm going to move my stitch selector back to straight stitch and my quick selector to straight stitch as well. I'm going to move my stitch length back to five. And yes, I did that all off of camera. So I move my stitch length to five. My stitch selector right there. I moved it from way over here all the way, where, where am I? Right to there, to our straight stitch. And then I moved our quick selector also to straight stitch. Let's do this final sew off. And I will do it with, uh, with no beautiful Japanese music, although I love listening to Japanese music. Don't you? It's so soothing. And especially in this, these, these pandemic days, I think all of us can use a little bit of soothing music, can't we? All right, I'm deciding how I'm gonna fold this. Like this maybe? two layers and then our traditional three layers of this compressed felt and kind of press that down so you can see exactly what we're going to be doing there's our three layers checking my camera there we go yep you can see it our three layers of compressed felt let's see how uh, Carolyn's machine does on this final task after sewing a multitude of sew-offs on that uh, Schmetz uh, leather needle. I'm just trying to get this to lay down a little bit. Oh, I see what part of the problem is. I have a cut on this end. See that? So that's why it's not laying down real well. Well, we'll just do our best. Get that underneath the presser foot. And again, Carolyn's machine does not have, uh, it does not have a hyperextension so we're having to kind of uh, work a little bit harder than we normally would to get it underneath the presser foot but it still has more than ample clearance so I think that uh, I guess the only feedback I would give to the designers of this machine that did, did it in Japan is uh, it could have benefited I think from having a little bit more presser foot clearance but I think you know the limits that we're pushing this machine to right now I think it's doing a fabulous job, don't you? So I'm going to do a straight stitch now at the widest, excuse me, at the widest. A wide straight stitch, who knew? Uh, I'm going to do a straight stitch now at the longest stitch length setting on five. And uh, again, I'm not going to do anything as far as adjusting presser foot, in part because this is supposed to auto adjust the presser foot pressure on this particular model. So we'll see how it does in auto adjusting for a task as difficult as this. And I did previously break a Schmetz needle, as you know, sewing this material. I hope I don't break a Schmetz leather needle today sewing it as well. So here we go. Oh, wow, we got, we almost didn't launch there. That was pretty exciting. <laughs> it's like, oh, are we, are we ready? Are we ready? I think we are. <laughs> Oh my gosh. All the fun stuff that happens in a live premiere. All the fun stuff that happens. I might just sew that one more time just to say, hey, who's in charge here? Well, technically, Herr Obermeister is because it's a Foff, but because it's out of Japan, I don't know, I might be able to get away, get away with doing it. So Those are beautiful stitches. Oh my gosh. Beautiful stitches. Let's buzz down just one more time just to show show who's boss here all right I have no idea who's in charge all right here we go take up arms all the way up yes all right let's launch definitively this time instead of with some degree of pause no pausing here we go yeah that's the way I wanted to do it that's the way I wanted to do it. Aha! 
See that? When you don't have operator error, there's all kinds of marvelous things the sewing machine can do. All kinds of marvelous things. Those are beautiful. Oh my gosh. Both rows, the one that I kind of blasted just now to show who was boss and the one previous to it, I think we'll probably, deciding here, yeah, I think you can see those to the side. If I have to pull them back, I'll pull them back, but I think we'll be good. I think you'll be able to see those okay. Once I get it to not tip over. Oh, that was exhausting. That was exhausting. I think I'm going to take a break <laughs> after we're done. All right. So here's our two rows of uh, straight stitching on these three layers of compressed felt. using a leather needle by the way. Aren't those gorgeous? And compressed felt as you know is not an easy task. When you have a material that can break a Schmetz needle, I mean they should use that for the space program. I should talk to John Smith about that if they ever use compressed felt. Because this stuff is this stuff is super strong. All right, let's look at the lock stitch after I pick the lint off of it. And I'm gonna have to pull this one back too. Give me a second here. All right, hoping you can see this because they are absolutely drop dead gorgeous. I had to kind of bend it. This stuff once you sew it, it kind of puckers a little bit. It's a little pucker thing going on. Absolutely gorgeous. Spacing the formation, the integrity of the stitch. And again, this stuff is dense enough through the, the process they use in compressing it. Uh, it's like sewing a super heavy grade, saddle grade leather almost. And we just buzzed through three layers of this stuff. Uh, and uh, Carolyn's machine had, I mean, no difficulty. That one, the first row that I did, because I didn't really launch properly, it had a little bit of a pause. It started to, you know, go into a little bit of a, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Uh, but after that, you know, after I, I got my rhythm down and I got the uh, right foot position on the foot controller and everything, uh, it just did uh, a spectacular, spectacular job. And you can see the outcome right there evidenced uh, with, again, three layers of compressed felt. There's, there's one side we're looking at right there. The other side. So this machine, I think, is, has just proven itself hands down. Uh, again, that 0.8 amp motor that the Japanese put in this model, I think, has performed beautifully. Uh, in spite of my limitations sometimes in not getting the right technique down or the right rhythm and setting it up for failure, and yet it's, it succeeded anyway. In spite of me, it succeeded anyway. Uh, and I think that's the beauty of having a machine that is fully optimized and ready to do the job is it can give you a lot of grace and a lot of forgiveness uh, as you're uh, having the privilege to use it. And if some of you haven't seen, and we're going to jump over there real quick. I should actually refresh that page right now so I know that it's going to work. At least I hope it's going to work. If the internet hasn't gone out again because of Spectrum... any more songs. Maybe I'll start over again. Yeah, why don't I do that? Okay. 
actually I don't like that one as much as my other one. Hold on a second. It's a cool song, I know, I know, but I like this one better. Yeah, this one's better. No, that's not the one I wanted. What the heck? There we go. Yes! This is mine. I like this. So here is Carolyn's Foff Hobby Model 560Z ready to go to work out in California to replace that machine that was stolen by that naughty, naughty service location that went out of business very abruptly and would not return her calls. What's that about? I bet you that, you know what? I'm, I'm just going to say it. I'll bet you they are the same ones that would stick those nasty, ugly, metallic stickers all over people's machines. So it's actually good that they kept it because if Carolyn had got that beloved 1970s Singer machine with a big metallic sticker on it, it might, it might have just pushed her over the edge. I mean, it would have pushed me over the edge. You know what I'm talking about. All right, so let's just look at all these sew-offs real quick. Not in detail, but I'm just gonna show you kind of in uh, the, the enormity of how much sewing we just did on this machine. And some of it off camera as well. So we just, we have our compressed felt here. We just did that. We did uh, genuine elk hide several times. There's one of the sew-offs that we did on this needle. Another one. Another one. And then we had this additional leather that we did all these decorative stitches on. And more leather, decorative stitching. More leather decorative stitching more leather decorative stitching eight layers of uh, commercial grade canvas yeah I know that would have been enough for me too but you know whatever and then finally four layers of heavy grade denim Yeah, yeah, I think, I think the machine is ready. Not to mention it has this really cool featherweight style uh, bed that can fold up and down. And Carolyn was saying that she's, you know, a little bit pressed for space in her place. So being able to fold this up and, uh, you know, being able to kind of tuck the machine away, I think will be a huge benefit to her. Not to mention you can very easily... Uh, take this free arm off as well but before I do that I'll just show you again that this little door right here on the front opens up and then you can access all your goodies right there and then just close it back up and you're you're ready to go back to business again or you can just slide the entire assembly off and access that uh, free arm uh, as well and it's real easy to put this back into place again <laughs> once you grab the thread that is it's really easy to put this back into place again so you can uh, have the benefit of that workspace all over again. So, And it really does have some beautiful workspace on it uh, on top of all the other pluses that I think the Japanese did a marvelous job of uh, engineering into this uh, Model 560Z. It's kind of fun to say that. It almost sounds like a car, doesn't it? What kind of, uh, what kind of vehicle you got there, mister? I've got a 560Z. What, uh, what kind of motor? Uh, it's got 0.8 amps. Wait, I didn't know the cars were running on amps. You never heard of an electric car? Where have you been? <laughs> so, at any rate, as I said in one of the posts on Facebook, let me zoom out a little bit, if I'm assuming I push it the right way. I'm almost there. I'm so close. All right, there we go, finally. <laughs> like I said on Facebook, this is the good stuff. Uh, I mean, I have the privilege of, of working with so many 
uh, fabulous customers uh, and so many fabulous machines. But when I can uh, step out of my, my space a little bit from running it as a business and help someone out like Carolyn who was just run through the ringers as far as this business that took her other machine many years ago and we can make that right, that's the good stuff. Uh, we're, we're called to help folks out, you know, in whatever we're doing in life. And, uh, and I certainly want this business of mine, Cow Country Vintage Sewing Machines and Restoration, that's such a long title, I should come up with a shorter version. Uh, but uh, it's so much fun to be able to step out of that space of running it as a business and, and looking at it as, as, a, as a transaction, even though it's obviously a mission-based business. It's still a business. And being able to step away from that for a little bit and do good. Uh, and I know Carolyn is grateful for it. I'm grateful to have the privilege to do it. And I'm, I know all of you are grateful to be a part of this as well. As we had a chance to run Carolyn's machine through the ringer today. And it just came out with glorious results. So uh, congratulations, Carolyn. I hope you really enjoy this machine. I hope it serves you well. I know it will. And, uh, you know, you can, you can drive by that old location if you're somewhere near it again. You can drive by that old location knowing that that chapter of the past is closed. Who cares about them now? And maybe they went on a business for a reason. You know, I never wish anybody bad fortune, but sometimes people just have it coming when they treat customers uh, like they treated Carolyn and surely others as well. So uh, enjoy the machine. Have fun with it. Uh, all of these sew-offs, which is probably going to add a couple of pounds to the shipping weight, are going to go with your machine so you can actually hold them in your own hand and you can revisit this premiere and just see how beautifully your machine did. So uh, with that, let's real quick, you thought I was going to end it, didn't you? <laughs> let's real quick pop over to, to Facebook and take a look at some of the shots of me taking Carolyn's machine apart. Some of the things just briefly on a real high level that I did to it. And then put it back together. Kind of. Yeah, we put it back together. And, uh, and now we can enjoy watching what was the past. Which is normally something I would do much earlier on. We're going to do it at the end today. And then wrap this up. Okay. Kinds of fun cow country stuff. Look at that. Mm -mm -mm -mm. I think we're stuck there. Nope, we're not stuck. Is that cute or what? And that's not doctored. That cow is actually licking that little guy's face. That is so cute. Oh my gosh, that's so cute. Okay, let's take a look at these pictures real quick. And then we'll wrap this up. And hopefully I remember to ring the bell. Otherwise, we're still in session. You can't go anywhere. You're stuck. Okay, so there's Carolyn's machine. When I was first beginning to uh, focus on it on the workbench and start taking it through um, a finalization process. Again, just kind of showing you the front side of it. It's just a really it's a good-looking machine, isn't it? I think it is. I think it's a really good-looking machine. Plus, it has that real cool fold-down bed. I've said that a couple times, but I'm going to keep saying it because I just think that that's awesome. It has almost like a featherweight look to it. They were just looking at different uh, features on the machine that we've already looked at several times during this premiere. And I like the stitch selection on this as well. It sounds like Carolyn's uh, Singer from the 1970s was a little bit more limited. I don't think it had all of these decorative stitches. I'm, I'm actually positive it didn't because she said she's really excited to try some of these uh, decorative stitches. Just again, if you're going to sew any of these in the yellow, yellow field, make sure you set the uh, stitch length on that yellow setting. Otherwise, uh, it's not going to work. And there I am playing with that cool little fold-down bed. Look at all that space. Carolyn's going to have a blast with this as far as all the workspace on this 560Z. Uh, 
Yeah, we're just kind of servicing some points in the faceplate area. And you can just see the the rugged engineering of this machine. It was built uh, with FOF quality, even though it was built in Japan. And there's our quick little selector there that we looked at several times during the premiere. Again, if you're going to use uh, any of the decorative stitches apart from the zigzag, you'll set it in the middle. Here's your zigzag settings, straight stitch, and here you have kind of a little modified uh, zigzag. Almost looks like a, a stretch type stitch. Here I'm going to open that little cool little door where Carolyn can put all of her goodies. She's going to get a number of different bobbins that go with the machine and uh, attachments, other things like that that she might need. Just showing the linear lines of that. And also the, the FOF branding. Oops, we're too low. Also the FOF branding and the hobby branding as well on the uh, inside of the machine. And there I've taken the back of the machine off because there's a lot of critical uh, service areas. I know we're going to get closer on those so I'm not going to zoom in right on this picture. And again it is a belt driven machine so whenever you have a belt driven machine that's kind of encased like that there's a number of additional areas that have to be serviced uh, as well. And again the quality of the engineering is kind of what I'm wanting to show in these shots along with the different areas that I'm servicing obviously. It's a well well built machine and one of my friends on Facebook uh, who hopefully is in attendance at this premiere and maybe can uh, chime in on a couple of things uh, said that she used to teach kids how to sew on this specific model back in the day and uh, she seemed really excited that Carolyn, Carolyn was going to get this particular model so she must have really had a great deal of uh, success with it working with the kids and I'm sure the kids enjoyed it as well because it's a fairly straightforward machine to use and here you can see uh, in the shot uh, it's just the on off switch on the the right side of the machine our plug in point for the power and everything for the foot controller and then right down here on the bottom it might be a little bit hard to see but it says made in Japan and then they've got this little window over here that really for this machine that came to the US is is for no purpose because that's where you would have a toggle switch to switch uh, between uh, US voltage and European voltage but there's, I can tell you having gone through the machine there there's nothing in there to do that with so uh, they must have used the same side side piece for the American and the machines that would have been in the European market and they just didn't equip this one with that uh, converter inside of there where you could basically use the machine in two different voltage settings and what you would have in there uh, I'll just show you real quick what you would have in there is something similar to this. This was actually taken out of a out of a foot controller that was dual voltage for a machine. But you'd have something like this. Where am I? You'd have something like this that would be wired in that would allow you to go from one voltage setting to another and not affect the machine adversely. This is basically a converter. All right, let's go to the next shot. <clears throat> yeah, there's just a close-up shot of it. And you can see they even put on here with this uh, plug-in point, they have a dual voltage setting, although the machine is not capable of doing that because it wasn't uh, set up with that equipment. Here I'm tearing apart the uh, raceway area, the hook system and everything, and just making sure that there's no barbs on it, uh, doing some deep cleaning. Uh, also checking hook timing as well. Closer shot. And you can see uh, the bobbin case right there, I think, in the shot uh, with the bobbin. And it's going to be real close. Uh, a lot of the Japanese machines use kind of a modified Class 15 style bobbin, and that's exactly what this machine uses as well. And there I'm just kind of digging some of the junk out of there. 
again, the raceway is kind of the brain center of the machine, and you need to make sure that that area is serviced very, very well. And you can see we started out with a little bit of rust uh, on the presser foot bar. And there was even a little bit on the needle bar as well. Extending all the way up. And I had to, uh, I had to mitigate uh, all of that rust to make sure that the machine was rust free and uh, ready to uh, go to work. There you can see even a closer shot of it. And that can happen on the surface of machines. If, uh, if a machine is, is stored, I have, I have some of my overflow machines from my collection out in my uh, uh, garage space where I have lots of shelves set up for machines. Hans has seen that because he, uh, he was on a video chat with me one time when I walked into that space. And I've got just row after row after row after row, five machines deep of various machines. And even though that that, mach that uh, area is a little bit climate controlled because I have an air conditioner out there, uh, it, can, uh, it can cause problems sometimes if you don't have it in a real stable environment. And just more shots again, different stitch options, which are fa fabulous, and also the FOF branding on the uh, pillar. There's a close-up of it. And you notice if you read the writing really close, made for FOF, not made by FOF, made for FOF out of Japan. <clears throat> more of a distant shot. And those are all the pictures. I have other pictures on Facebook as well uh, showing the um, showing the machine after the rust and everything was mitigated, but you could pretty much see that obviously during the uh, sew-offs today. So I'm not going to you know go through that again and show that to you again. so. All right, well, let's go over to Carolyn's machine and wrap this puppy up. Look at that huge. Wow. Yeah, I think we did enough confirmation sew-offs. We could do more, but I, I think that would be kind of crazy. I think that would be super crazy, don't you? All right, well, this has been a fun premiere. Again, just because of the fact that we're having a chance to send a machine off uh, to Carolyn out in California. We're having a chance to see a new beginning. Like this really cool new beginning music right now. And that's what I'm going to call it, a new beginning music. So, uh, God bless everybody. Stay tuned for other premieres like this where we're probably going to also have really cool Japanese music. You just never know on this channel. So God bless, take care, and remember, you're never old until regrets take the place of your dreams, so hang on to your dreams. And more importantly, and if you follow me a lot, you already finished it. Take action. Bye for now.